We started uh, our walk through the book of Ephesians last Sunday. Uh, of course, that New Testament book, you know, find the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you have Acts, then you have Romans, and First and Second Corinthians, and then, of course, Galatians and Ephesians. If you hit Philippians and Colossians, you've gone just a little too far. Backtrack. Uh, we didn't get terribly far last week. We're picking up in verse 7 this morning. Uh, but please understand, this isn't a race. You know, there, there wasn't a, a, another church on the other side of town that, that started this book the same week that we did. And, you know, we're racing to see who could get through the end of it first. Uh, that would be ridiculous. You know, there's so much to learn and to chew on in this, uh, man, this incredible letter that, that Paul the Apostle writes to the church in Ephesus. Uh, last week, actually, we started with some background. We didn't even start in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, we started in, you know, Acts chapter 18 and worked our way into Acts chapter 19 as well. We looked at, you know, how Paul first came to arrive in Ephesus, you know, his initial experiences there, uh, followed him through the two years that he taught in the school of Tyrannus, um, you know, looked a little bit at the kinds of things that, that he faced uh, oppositionally uh, in Ephesus, uh, even, you know, how he departed this great, you know, you know tumult that took place and you know all of the silversmiths these people that were fashioning these false gods to the goddess Diana um, their uh, their economy was was in trouble because the teaching uh, of Paul more importantly the the gospel of Jesus Christ was uh, impacting the community and the people weren't buying the wares of the temple you know they weren't interested in the worship of the goddess Diana you know this false god of the Ephesian people they were uh, interested in hearing more about Jesus Christ and him crucified. And, you know, so all of these craftsmen that, uh, you know, their, their trade was in danger, they, they rose up, not just against Paul, but his ministry companions, actually trapping a couple of his companions in this, you know, kind of amphitheater in town. Uh, thankfully, you know, a notable figure in town is able to, you know, calm the crowd and usher them away, and uh, they all escape with their lives. Um, man, it, it's just a picture of, you know, how the world responds when men and women of God are being uh, fruitful in service to him, you know. Uh, the devil doesn't like to lose ground. I don't know if you've noticed that in your life. Um, you know, pastors go through a lot of troubles and trials. Uh, and, you know, people will often ask me, you know, I see you going through this, or these people are coming against you, or that, you know, group is coming against you, and you know, does that bother you? Are you hurting? And, um, you know, I, no one likes to be attacked publicly, but uh, in full transparency, if, if my life is going like super easy and nothing's coming against me, I often sit there and think, you know, why isn't the devil upset with me? You know, why, why, why is uh, the devil not coming after me? And so uh, if, if there is that kind of opposition, you know that the devil is, is trying to get to you. He's trying to you know, maybe take your focus on what you're supposed to be doing to put it on something else. Maybe to defend yourself instead of, you know, propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, um, you know, you, you have to be reminded that these things will happen. You know, it, it happened often in the Apostle Paul's life. We see it in the life of, of all of the apostles as they went out. And we see it uh, through the age, the church age. You know, how often the church was persecuted. But, you know, what you need to to know what we should learn from church persecution is that the persecuted church is often the church that's growing the most. Uh, if you look in uh, places around the world where, uh, you know, the church is persecuted, you know, North Korea is a great example of that, China, uh, a lot of countries in the Middle East where it's illegal to own a Bible or speak in the name of Jesus, uh, the church there is often the strongest. It's often the most bold. Uh, where we have all of this freedom in America, the church uh, is often lethargic. And so I hope that doesn't speak to us. You know, if it, you know, potentially speaks to you, if that pricks your heart, praise the Lord. You know, it's an opportunity to, to wake up and to be useful for the kingdom. Certainly, you can look at the Acts of the Apostles and, you know, kind of get an idea of what it is to be persecuted and how they, they continue to press on. And so, you know, from all of that, we, we began to dig into the letter itself, into Ephesians chapter 1, of course, with the introduction. You know, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, you know, uh, 
Paul was not an apostle because it's what he chose to do. It's, it's what he wanted to do, uh, you know, from childhood. You know, a lot of kids today, you know, I want to be a police officer. I want to be an astronaut. You know, uh, I don't think Paul as a child, Saul of Tarsus, you know, told mom and dad that, you know, he wanted to be a persecuted apostle. But it's what God chose for him. You know, we have to set aside what we've chosen to do in this life and learn to live our lives for the Lord. That's not to say, you know, you went to college and you have a great career and you should walk away from that to go stand on a corner in a soapbox. And No, that's not what I'm saying. You know, you can do what you were trained to do and still do what God has called you to do. Paul was a, a tent maker by trade. You know, he was faithful in his service. He, you know, worked hard with his hands, you know, not just for himself, but we see him ministering to others that way. And no doubt, uh, he was most importantly apostle of Jesus Christ. We see who the letter's written to. You know, it says the saints and the faithful. You know, these people were uh, set apart from the world. The word saints is consecrated. They were set apart from the world uh, and they were faithful. They were wholly dedicated unto the Lord. Verse 2, we read, Grace and peace, uh, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, these, these characteristics that should be present in every believer's life, uh, important that we're able to see them in our own, not just that we're recipients of these things, but that we need to learn uh, to extend these things to others. Uh, and then we see, really kind of doubled down on that in verse 3. You know, Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. He's talking about, you know, being able to, to see the blessings of God in your life. You know, even if you're, you know, not the richest guy on the block. You know, even if, you know, you struggle at times, you know, to, to keep your thoughts captive, you know, if you deal with anxiety or fear, you know, you have to be willing and, and more importantly able uh, to see the blessings that God pours out on us. People far too often in this life focus on those things that are hard instead of those things that are good, those things that God is doing. You know, we need to learn to focus on what God is doing, and I think our attitudes will reflect that. You know, as we see God blessing us, you know, the conversation was we need to learn to go out and bless others. You know, we can be blessings to God by blessing others. And again, the Apostle Paul's life was a pretty great example of that. And then in verses 4, 5, and 6, we got into pretty, some pretty significant doctrine. Uh, don't forget the first three chapters, you know, uh, primarily doctrinal. The last three chapters, primarily, it's kind of practical Christian living. That's not to say there isn't practical, practical Christian living in the first three chapters, and there isn't doctrine in the last three, but Again, just primarily speaking, it kind of plays out that way. Um, we saw in those verses uh, that they were known, the church in Ephesus, and certainly we were as well from the foundation of the world. God foreknew us. We also read that they were predestined unto adoption. Um, you have to be able to balance predestination and foreknowledge. We spent a lot of time talking about that. Uh, in Romans chapter 8. Actually, we spent a lot of time in Romans chapter 8 last week. We'll spend a little time in Romans chapter 8 this week. Uh, so let's go ahead and dig a little deeper. Verse 7, Paul writes, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. And so, the redemption church that we have in Christ, uh, and we'll talk a lot more about this in chapter 2, but you need to know it doesn't come through our own works, okay? That's a conversation that's worth having early and often. Your redemption, you know, you don't receive that because of something you have done, but rather because of something that, that God did for us, something that Jesus did on our behalf. You see, we enter into redemption through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And there is no other way. You know, in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. He didn't say, I'm one of the ways. He didn't say, I'm one of the truths, or I'm one of the lives. No, he said, I'm the way. I'm the truth, and I'm the life. This world needs to hear that today. I, I dare to say the church needs to hear that today. There's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of, you know, religion out there that says there are a lot of different paths to heaven. That even potentially your own works can earn you a ticket. And yet the word of God stands 
strictly against that. And like I said, in, in chapter 2, we'll talk uh, a lot more about that. But the word redemption itself, it actually means a releasing affected by the payment of a ransom. Okay, and, and I think that's important, not only because we read it here, but because of something Paul said to the, to the leadership in the church at Ephesus um, in Acts chapter uh, 20. You see, after Paul, <coughs> excuse me, after Paul left Ephesus, you know, and went about his business, uh, you know, ministering to others, uh, eventually he was coming back through the area, but he didn't really have time to stop in Ephesus and, you know, set up a, a camp again and, you know, go through all of the process. And so he called the leadership of the church out to meet with him because he had something important that, that he needed to say that no, no doubt they needed to hear. Uh, and we read that in Acts chapter 20, verse 27 and 28. He says there, For I have not shunned to declare unto you the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. You see, he gives them a charge to watch over the church and he's, he's making it clear even though he's conveying the information to them, it was the Holy Spirit calling them. But then he, he really kind of lays out that picture of redemption. He says that, that they, and no doubt, in turn us, those that have come to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord, those that have repented of sin and accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, we see. It says he's purchased us with his own blood. You see, church, Jesus Christ paid my ransom. He paid your ransom. You need to be able to see that. When we think of the cross at Calvary, when we think of the work that Jesus did there as his blood spilled out on the ground, that was the, the payment. You become his, his purchased possession through the spilling of his blood. And, and he did that, as it says here, according to the riches of his grace. The riches of his grace, church. You know, grace is, is one of those words. You know, again, we, we saw it at the beginning of the letter. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is one of those words that the church really has to be familiar with. You know, that, that we have to become intimate with. You know, there's that acronym out there, you know, grace. You know, God's riches at Christ's expense. You know, it's a, it's a decent you know, kind of look at what grace is, how we should uh, consider God's work in our lives, his grace toward us. But there's another way that you need to know God's grace in your life. You see, grace is you getting what you don't deserve. You know, mercy, on the other hand, is you not getting what you do deserve. See, in grace, God gave us his son, Jesus Christ. You don't deserve him. I don't deserve him. There's nothing that we could do. There's nothing you could do to earn or deserve Jesus Christ. In grace, God gave us that gift. You know, the mercy side of that is also important to understand. You know, it's God not giving us what we do deserve. We deserve judgment. We deserve punishment for sin. But because of God's grace, church, because of the grace poured out at the cross at Calvary, we don't, we don't have to enter into the, to the judgment that's, promised upon this world. I think it's important not to confuse God's grace and his mercy, and I think a lot of people do. Verse 9, he goes on, he says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, you know, just kind of the, the management of time there, in the dispensation, dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. That's a pretty deep thought. Amen? Amen. I mean, gosh, when you sit there and you think about that, you know, it, it really does take some time to work through it all. And, and what I want to do is kind of break it up into sections so we can properly unpack it. 
you know, without getting too deep that we spend the next six months here, because there's a chance I could do that. You know, church, part of what, part of what belongs to us under the, the riches of God's grace, remember that's a part of this conversation, part of, a, uh, of what belongs to us under that, that, that promise, the riches of his grace, is the knowledge of the mystery of his will. And it's interesting, really, uh, you know, Man, if you kind of throw that into YouTube, what is the mystery of God's will, if you Google that, you're going to come up with a lot of crazy stuff. You know, I, I tell people often, be very careful what you put into search engines, you know, because you're not necessarily going to get the same kind of doctrine that, you know, uh, is fruitful to you. Uh, but even if you go video to video, you know, one video might be, you know, someone who's an Arminianist, and the next video might be someone who's a Calvinist, and, you know, they're talking about the same things, but coming at it from very different points of view, and it uh, more than likely is going to confuse you rather than build you up. And so again, you know, it's not to say that it's terrible to look at things, you know, on, on YouTube or uh, on the internet when it comes to you know, doctrine or theology, but you have to be careful how you do that, you know. What is the mystery of God's will? You know, ultimately, you know, like I actually said to you last week, and I, I tell you pretty often, it's really important that as you're reading the Word of God, you know, you, you take notes, you ask yourself questions, you know, put some big question marks in, in certain places and go back and take some time to, you know, unpack that on your own. You know, dig into it, study the Word, because God will reveal it to you. You know, the mystery of God's will is actually kind of simple. You know, it's, it's God's great plan, you know, that plan that was once hidden to the world, but is now, it's now open to us. As, as we enter into a relationship with Him, He reveals these things to us. You know, in the New Testament, a mystery is something that's hidden to the world, but can be apparent to Christians. It should be really clear to us as Christians. It's not always clear to Christians because, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not condemning anyone, but I, I do feel like it's important to be challenged. You know, sometimes people will read the Bible, and then immediately under the, the, the text in the Bible, there's, you know, someone's uh, opinion of that. You know, uh, these commentaries that are out there, there's a lot of good commentaries, but there are also commentaries that aren't so great. You know, you don't want to just pick a Bible at random because you like the, you know, type of leather cover that's on there and you like the size of the print and that kind of thing. Oh, that's the font that I'm fond of. It's easier for me to read. And then just also consume every word that comes from man that's underneath it. A lot of people do that. And when they do, it gets really hard for them to hear the Holy Spirit on their own. You become very reliant on men. Again, it's not to say that commentaries are the worst thing in the world. You know, I, I look at commentaries from time to time. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown is a good commentary. If you're interested in one, that's a decent commentary. It's great, I think. You know, uh, the J. Vernon McGee, uh, Through the Bible Commentary, is a good commentary. You know the best commentary? The very best one I could ever recommend? It's right here. I keep it on the pulpit all the time. I got it in my car. It's on my phone. This is the, the best commentary for the Bible is the Bible. Because this book, it has everything that you need to know. I mean, it, it defines itself if we give it the opportunity to do so. And again, unfortunately, a lot of people won't always do that. And so when it comes to something like this, the mystery of God's will... You know, there's this panic that sets in. It's a mystery. That means I can never, you know, come to understand it. That's not at all what it means. It just means that it was once hidden to the world, but now is evident to us in Christ. That's the mystery of God's will. We have the knowledge of the mystery of his will revealed to us, church, and we're told why here to bring together all things in Christ. That's why God reveals the mystery of his will to us. To bring all things together in Christ, but you need to understand, that's either Christ as Savior or Christ as Judge. You see, either way, our Father in Heaven is going to bring all things together in Him. And I think like last week, we, we, I even said this earlier, we spent you know, a decent amount of time in Romans chapter 8, and this is the occasion that I referenced where we're going to go back there, Romans 8 verses 18 to 22, gives us a Another picture of what it is that, you know, Paul's kind of talking about here. Maybe it'll help us pick up what he's putting down. Romans 8.18, he, 
He says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him that hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. We have this mystery of God's will, and God's will, you know, in it, all things will be brought together in Christ, for many, it will be Christ as Savior, and for many, it will be Christ as Judge. And then again, back here in Ephesians 1, we have this, this reference, an important reference to our inheritance. And that's connected to being predestined to the praise of His glory. Part of your inheritance is that God, again, foreknew you, and in knowing the life you would live and the choices that you would make, He predestined you. You know, they go hand in hand. God predestined you to be to the praise of his glory. You know, the, the thought, church, of our inheritance in Christ, I mean, it should be uh, first comforting. I believe it should be transforming. And I can tell you in my own life, it's been incredibly empowering. And I, and I want to tell you why that is. And I hope that you can make a connection to this so that, you know, if you haven't already kind of gravitated to this point that you could go out and experience this yourself. You know, the thought of our inheritance in Christ is comforting because, church, it reminds us that this world is not our home. You know, in John chapter 17, Jesus prays that very thing. He makes it very clear that this world was not his home, that we should know, but he also declares that it's not our home. It's not your home, church. You're a sojourner in this land. If you have repented of your sins and accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have a promised inheritance, and this is not it. You know, if uh, people in the Jehovah's Witness movement, for instance, uh, their promised inheritance is this earth. Can you imagine that? I'm, I'm often shocked that people continue to, you know, uh, fall prey to that uh, religion. Uh, really, quite frankly, that cult. You know, the idea uh, within Jehovah's Witness, uh, the religion, is that there's only 144,000 people that get into heaven. You know, Revelation chapter 7, right? And so there's a list in the Jehovah's Witness Church of the first 144,000 people that sign their names to the covenant of the Jehovah's Witness movement, and they're the only ones that get into heaven. Everybody else is promised eternity, but it's here on earth. I'm looking around, and this don't look like heaven to me. No matter what version of it you might think is, is pretty great. There's some beautiful places on planet earth. I've seen a lot of them but nothing compared to what we read about what God has for us. Read the book of Revelation. A lot of people are afraid of that book. It is a beautiful book, and it does speak to the comfort that we should have, that promised inheritance that, you know, really, uh, I think, brings us into a foundation of our faith. You know, the, the thought of our inheritance in Christ, it's also uh, transforming church because it it helps to shape us and, and mold us into the people that God created us to be. If you're focusing on Christ and his inheritance, he's going to do a work in you that you can't do on your own. If you're focused on the world, it's going to take a long time for that work to happen. You know, that thought of the inheritance we have in Christ, and maybe most of all, is empowering. Because church, it encourages us to go out and to boldly proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. You know, that's something that the church doesn't do as often as it should. And when I say the church, I'm not talking about what goes on within these walls. We are the church. You know, the hands and the feet of the church, the beating heart of the church, the legs and the feet of the church. And we're called to go out from this place. We come and we gather and we fellowship and we worship and we enjoy each other. But what we do the rest of the week, we're still the church. And we're called to go out and to be bold. And to take the, the good news of Jesus Christ with us. And it's a lot easier to do if you're focused on that promise of inheritance. If you're focused on what God has promised for you and not what this world has already dealt you. And don't forget, I think it's kind of hard to actually in the first chapter of, of Ephesians here. But, but don't forget that, that God has predestined you to this. 
He's predestined you to be to the praise of his glory. Knowing that should light a fire in you to, to go out and fulfill that. God has a plan for you. Go walk it out. You're chosen by God. Yes, you have a, a free will to accept that call, but you are chosen by him to bring glory to his name. And man, I, I don't know about you, but that gives me a lot of joy. Understanding that God foreknew me, and in that he predestined me to be to the praise of his glory, to bring glory to his name, to live my life in a manner that this world would say, you know what, what's going on in that dude is different than the, the pain and agony and suffering that I see in this world. And I would imagine, you know, I know a lot of you guys pretty personally, and I would imagine that a lot of people on planet Earth see that in you too. It's up to us, church, to go out and to, to do that work, to be the praise of his glory. And you need to know that's, that's the work that the Holy Spirit will do in you. Verse 13, it says, In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. That's you, the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. You see, church, God's, God's sovereign plan for your life, it works. You know, if you take notes, write that down. God's plan for my life works. You know, hopefully that's not a revelation to you. It's not new news. God's perfect plan for your life works, but it does not exclude your free will cooperation. It is important, it is imperative that you cooperate with God's plan. You know, the saints and the faithful here in the church at Ephesus, yes, they had been called by God. Yes, he had a plan for them. But they needed to learn to trust him in that plan, right? Have you learned that? Have you, have you learned to trust God in his plan for your life? You know, there's a, there's a passage of scripture that I, I share with you guys a lot, and it's because I, I really, truly do believe it, it's important. You know, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Really simple. You know, it's got a really great cadence to it, so it's easy to memorize. You know, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. You know, we have to learn to trust that God's plan is better than our plan. Let me burst a bubble for you in case someone hasn't already in your life. God's plan is better than your plan. And you have to learn to set your plan down to walk in his. I can tell you that as a rather rebellious, pretty hard-headed young man, that was tough for me. You know, I actually was really excited about serving God, but I wanted God to work inside of my plan. And he said, no, I, I, I've got a plan, but it's different than yours. And trust me, you'll like it better, you know. And man, I warred against him at times. And every time I tried to force my will over his, man, failure, you know. I mean, I'm talking about spinning out of control, you know, burning off in the atmosphere. I mean, absolute failures. But when you settle yourself to God's plan, when you learn to trust the Lord with all your heart, and stop leaning into your own understanding of how things are supposed to go. You know, if you learn to acknowledge him in all your ways, then you know what? Every time. I promise you, every time he will direct your path. You know why I, I feel comfortable making that promise to you this morning? Because it's not my promise. It's the word of God. This is the breath of God. And if he has promised it to us, who are we to say, uh, Lord, I don't know, man. I think my plan's pretty good. I mean, when God speaks to you through his word, you have to learn to be obedient to what he's saying. Again, you have to trust that, you know, his plan's better than your plan. Be obedient, lay down your life, walk in his, and man, he's going to blow your socks off. Especially when it comes to surrendering your life to him. I mean, that's where it all starts. You know, a, a lot of people really want to hold on to some of those reins. You know, but really a relationship with God is about giving the reins over to him. You know, letting him, you know, put that bridle in your mouth, but give him the reins. Let him lead. Let him guide. He's, man, his compass is, is better than yours. And, and I think a lot of people 
struggle with that. The idea is really resting in Christ, and people have a hard time with the concept of you know, resting anymore. There's a lot of laziness. I'm not talking about laziness. I'm talking about learning to rest in Christ. You know, learning to, to be comfortable with, with what he is doing and, and not going, well, okay, I see your plan, but uh, there, there's a few things I'd like to fix about it. No, just rest in his plan. Just trust him. You know, I've shared this story with you a lot, and I'm not going to get too deep into it because of time's sake, but, you know, uh, from 2007 to 2009, my wife and I, living in Tempe, Arizona, uh, faithful in ministry, successful in ministry, I had a successful business, everything in my life was going incredibly well, and yet the Lord was calling us out from our family and our friends, telling me to lay down my business and to go out and plant a church somewhere else in the country, and I didn't know where. And I spent two years, we looked at 22 different states, and I'm telling you, I wanted to move to the Pacific Northwest. I, I, lo- I had been born in Oregon, although I'd lived most of my life in Arizona. I loved the idea of either going back to, you know, the Oregon coast or maybe following that up into Washington State, like two of the most liberal places in the country. Can you imagine? I'm sorry. I, it's just, I'm so thankful I'm not there. But that was my plan. And God said, I have a different plan for you. And he brought me to Iowa in January of 2009. I'm, I'm, st- I'm standing in this state, in this city, in January in Iowa. And I said, you've got to be nuts, God. I'm not kidding. I, I think those were the exact words. You've got to be nuts. It is absolutely frozen here. You know, I couldn't wait to get back to Arizona. But God had made it so abundantly clear that this is where we were supposed to be. My wife and I knew that we were in sin if we wouldn't just go put our house on the market in one of the worst housing markets, housing crashes that our nation had known, to go sell our house and move to a place that, by the way, I told my wife I would never move to on our honeymoon. She said on our honeymoon, and by the way, we did premarital counseling, and this never came up, so I still have an issue with that, but... um, (laughs) On our honeymoon, where she looks across the table at me and she says, what do you think about moving to the Midwest someday? I'm like, Midwest, dude, what is that? You know, that's like the states people fly over to get to places they want to be. <laughs> I honestly had never been to the Midwest in my life. I'd seen a good chunk of the world. I'd never been to the Midwest. And I, didn't, I, I don't think these were the exact words, but the idea is very clear. I said, get behind me, Satan. What are you talking about? You know? Like, do we need to go sit down with our our pastor in Arizona and figure out, like, they let us get married. Like, you want to live in the Midwest? You know? And yet I find myself the most content, the the, the most blessed I've ever been in my life, in a place I never wanted to be. Because I said, you know what, God, your plan's better than my plan. We have to learn to lay our, our lives down, and that includes laying down our own plans, surrendering our lives to him. Resting in Christ. You know, church, it's easier to rest in Christ when you understand that something that, that Paul writes here. He talks about us being sealed. You know, man, one of the, I, th- I think one of the great promises of the Word of God, uh, we're, we're told um, in, in verse 13, you know, in whom you've trusted, after you've heard the Word of truth, hopefully that's you, you've heard God's truth, you're learning to trust Him, that's the gospel of your salvation, in whom, after you believed, He says, after you believed, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. In order for you to truly rest in this life, in Christ, you, you might need to know what that means. The word sealed, it's actually used in the Greek form twice in this letter. Uh, it, it's frigazo. It's used 28 times in the New Testament. To be fair, quite a few of those are in Revelation chapter 7 dealing with the 144,000. God's seal upon them. But man, it, it speaks to you to your walk with him, to his covering over you. See the word, again, sfrigazo, it means to set a seal upon, check it out, to set a seal on, to mark with a seal, and to seal for security from Satan. That's, I love that that's part of the Greek definition of this word. God, literally, through the power of his Holy Spirit, has marked you with his seal, and for the specific purpose of protecting you from Satan. You see, a lot of people in this life are so worried about what the devil can do. I think it's because a lot of y'all are watching horror movies. Like, you know, I I think if the world, like, made less scary movies, there'd be less fear of what Satan could do in your life. You know, he's the devil. You know, truly, the word of God declares one day he'll be trodden under our feet. We shouldn't be worried about what the devil can do in our lives, especially 
when it comes to this because God tells us, I've sealed you. I've marked you with the blood of Jesus Christ. And I will protect you from Satan. Like I said, there's 28 references to it. I just want to share two others. Uh, one is in the book of 2 Corinthians, and then one is in Ephesians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22 says, He which establishes us with you in, is in Christ and hath anointed us is God. So God establishes and anoints in Christ. And it says that he's also sealed us, shvagazod us, marked us with his seal for protection from Satan and given us the earnest of the spirit in our hearts. Do you feel that? You know, you truly have to choose to walk in that, to believe that. But when you do, I'm telling you, it is so freeing. We need to learn to find rest in that church, to rest in the promise that God has placed his seal upon us, and there's nothing that Satan can do about that. Verse 15, it says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Church, an intentional prayer life was part of Paul's ministry to the church. And not just to the church in Ephesus. We read it in Romans 1, 1 Thessalonians 1. We read it in Paul's letter to Philemon, you know, the slave. Part of his ministry was prayer. You need to know part of my ministry to you is prayer. I'm faithful to pray for you. Uh, many of you, specifically and by name, and many of you, you know, where we have more of a cursory relationship, you know, I'd love to, to develop that further. But I pray for everyone in this church on a pretty much a daily basis. It's part of what God, you know, puts on those that are called to lead. But it's also called for all of us. Actually, we read what it was that Paul prayed for them in the next few verses. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom, revelation in the knowledge of him. What did Paul pray for the church? Well, that they would have wisdom, that they would have knowledge and revelation of him. We need every one of those things today. The church is often vacant of these ideas, even willfully ignorant rather than spiritually sound when it comes to wisdom and the knowledge of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And again, these are things that I've committed to pray for each of you. And I would ask that you would be faithful to pray these things for me and for my family that you would be faithful to pray for, for our safety and for our protection as we are faithful to, to pray these things for you. That's part of being the church together. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. If the church at Ephesus was going to be successful in knowing all that God had given them, church, it was going to have to be a supernatural work. A supernatural work. The eyes of their, stand, their understanding would have to be opened. The question is open to what? The hope of his calling. So what, what is hope? You, know, you may have noticed my shirt. Hope dealer. You know, I, I truly uh, believe that that's part of my call in ministry to the community at large. To go out and share the hope of the Lord with others. I, actually, this is only the second time I've ever wore this shirt. I was sharing with Aaron earlier, uh, or Derek. Uh, a few, uh, maybe a couple months ago, I was in the grocery store and I had this shirt on. And I, this guy was giving me the weirdest looks. And I thought maybe, you know, I had done something to offend him. Or, and I was like, oh, do I, you know, I'm just always, I just, do I know you? What's up, you know? Um, and he said, what in the world is a hope dealer? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. You know, we might be in the ice cream section, you know, open a bar. Let's get down to it, you know. Um, we should all be full of God's hope, you know. But there's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to hope. People today have hope in, in other men. You know, they have hope in government systems. But our hope is in Christ. You see, hope, you know, in a biblical sense, hope is the earnest expectation of good things. You know, I have an earnest expectation of good things in Jesus Christ and in Christ alone. So what's the hope of his calling? Well, the hope of, of his calling is a hope that's focused on, on future things, you know, future events. 
You know, as a believer in Jesus Christ, I have a hope in a glorious future resurrection. Do you have that hope? As a believer in Jesus Christ, I have a hope in a glorious future resurrection, and that's only in Christ. I have a hope in eternal life, a hope in freedom from sin, a hope in perfected justification, church. I have hope, and not because of something that I've done or something that I've learned in this world. I have hope because of Jesus Christ. And we need that hope. The reason so many people are suffering today is because they don't have hope. Would you become a hope dealer for those that need it the most? Would you please share the hope that you have with others? Stop holding on to it yourself if you are. And and of course, we're not just talking about the hope of his calling. It includes the knowledge of the riches of the glory of his inheritance, the exceeding greatness of his power to us. You know, a lot of Christians, they never come to understand any of this. Because they're so focused on temporary things, they'll never come to understand the eternal. If your eyes are on this world, you'll lose sight of heaven. But if your eyes are on heaven, you'll lose sight of this earth. Man, where are your eyes? Over the last few years, a lot of our eyes have been on the things of this world. You know, the reason that I was never worried about that scamdemic and masks and vaccines and all the garbage that everybody fell prey to was because I have hope in Jesus Christ. This place isn't my home. If God takes me home, so be it. Praise the Lord. I've been set free. But too many people are focused on this place. You know, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, it says, For our light affliction is but for a moment, but it works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at things which are not seen, for the things that are seen are temporal, and the things that are not seen are eternal. You know, all week long, studying through this, I found myself singing that old hymn, you know, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this world will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And it just speaks so much to what was going on in Paul's heart. And then Paul, he kind of continues here with an important reminder. He says, all this is according to the working of his mighty power, not mine, not yours, not Paul's, but but God's, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. You know, this is where Christ is right now, church. He's at the right hand of the Father making intercession for the things that you did on the way to church this morning. Amen? Praise the Lord for Jesus Christ. He's at the right hand of the Father. I mean, Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us. I don't have time. Write down 1 John 2, 1 and 2. Read that. Find your strength in that. Let's finish with the thought of Christ on his throne. It says he's put all things under his feet and gave to him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Church, all things are under his feet. Government entities, medical communities, big pharma, you know, All things, school boards, you know, everything in this world that people spend so much time fretting over, just put it under the feet of God where it belongs because that's where it is. Everything in heaven, on earth, we're told, will one day bow the knee and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you know what? I want to close out with that thought. Turn one book to your right, to the book of uh, Philippians. Philippians. That's like, that's a fun book. (laughs) When, when I first came back to the Lord, I, I was talking to this guy in the men's ministry at our church in Arizona, and he, he was saying something to me, and I said, is that in the Bible? What book's that in? And he said, it's in First Thessalonians." <laughs> I was looked at him, and I said, that sounds right, man. <laughs> Philippians 2.5, Paul writing to the church in Philippi, he says, let this mind be you in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He's, he's talking to you today as well, church. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, 
took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You see, church, Jesus humbled himself. We need to learn to be humble before him. Jesus became obedient to death because he was obedient to the Father. And yet, we are often so rebellious in how we live our lives. Humility and obedience are key when it comes to walking with the Lord. Verse 9, Wherefore, God hath also highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things on earth, and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That is a promise. One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I know a lot of people use that as a reason, an excuse almost, not to share their faith. Oh, I don't need to talk to, you know, my sister who's not serving God because, you know, the Bible says every knee will bow. That's not like in subjection to God, like, oh, I, I, I see you finally, Lord. We hope that they will, but the promise is regardless of whether they choose to or not, whether it's in salvation or judgment, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Most men will experience this in judgment. Look out at planet Earth today and it's obvious. It's more obvious than it's ever been. And knowing that, especially since we're leaving here today closer to God because we came, shouldn't we go out and do our part? You know, as we see Paul the Apostle doing, as we see the other apostles as they were sent out from Christ, as we saw Christ himself do, go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be a minister of, of hope and the good news of the calling that God has placed on your life. Minister his, his grace to those in your family and, and those who are your friends, those that live on your street. You know what? Hold nothing back. You know, find a way to be proactive in the sharing of your faith. And I'm telling you, the Lord will meet you in that place. He'll change your life. You think you can't do it? Well, I'm here to tell you that I know I can't. But yet somehow, I find myself in a position, day in and day out, to do it anyway. And not just because I'm standing here, but because when I go to the grocery store, or when I go to the bank, or, you know, wherever I'm at, I, I look for ways to be bold in Christ to share my faith, to talk to people that I might ignore otherwise. I actually often look for people that are most different from me rather than trying to connect to people that are the same. If we'll go out, if the church would go out and act in such a manner, we could change this community in no time. Would you join me in that work? Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for its, its Lord, cleansing power. Thank you for the way that it, it builds us up, Lord God, and thank you for the way that it sends us out. Lord God, that we could be the, the vessels you created us to be, the people, Lord, the hands and the feet and the voices of your kingdom, going out into a dark and dying land and proclaiming Jesus Christ as the light of the world. Father, I pray that you would not only give us boldness, but the words to say and the, the heart to trust you. Every step, to put our faith in you, Lord God, and to believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, Lord, you are good enough. You are strong enough, Lord, to not only change our lives, but the lives of those around us as well.